This episode is brought to you by the Girl Scouts of Colorado. Because studies show that being a Girl Scout improves girls' confidence and helps them weather life's challenges. Everything a Girl Scout does revolves around finding their people, discovering their joy, and knowing their power. From planting trees to stocking a food pantry, Girl Scouts learn they have the power to make a difference. I think the only time I went to the Sand Dudes was with my Girl Scout troop. Man, they taught me how to enjoy camping sometimes. Be a part of something big. Be a Girl Scout. Troops are forming right now in your neighborhood. Go to girlscoutsofcolorado.org forward slash join to start her adventure. Thanks, Troop 664. (laughs) Today on CityCast Denver. What does Nuggets owner Stan Kroenke have in common with one of Denver's largest Latino arts and culture organizations and the Colorado Department of Transportation? Turns out they are all investing big money in the dream of a huge new neighborhood, stretching from the confluence all the way down to 6th Avenue. And today, me and producer Paul Caroli are sharing some updates on those plans, plus all the other local stories that matter this week. Today is Tuesday, August 22nd. I'm Bree Davies, and here's what Denver's talking about. Well, I saw Barbie this weekend. Tell I, me everything. It's one of the greatest movies I've ever seen. <laughs> okay. I cried and <laughs> I laughed so hard I almost fell over. I had never seen, luckily no preview had showed me the part where all the Kens sing. The Ken dance? And no, when they do uh, Matchbox 20s, like I want to push you around while they're playing guitar and, and they stare into your eyes yeah. for four and a half minutes. I was like, oh, this has happened to me and so many people I know. <laughs> <laughs> like when you're dating a guy that's in a band that's not that great i'm not talking about my husband he's a drummer he's never done this to me but just being like when is this gonna be over please stop and it was just like i was like greta gerwig is we've had a lot of similar experiences in the world yeah but overarchingly in brilliant credible movie so funny incredible i'm a little offended that people would recommend you see a movie about a man right after that oppenheimer oh please why would you why would you ruin why would you sully this gorgeous piece of art why not you know what it's, a, it's contrast it's two great tastes that taste great together it's salty and sweet i don't it's I'm, great i'm offended but anyway sure. we're not talking about movies no it's tuesday here and we're talking about the news we're talking about the local stories that matter this week yes And we have a couple, we have an update, uh, we have a correction, and then we have a bigger story. I'll do the correction just super quick. Sure. So last Friday, we were talking about HOAs um, with Joshua Emerson because there was, um, there's new, there's lawmakers working on the fact that HOAs at this point in some capacity can take people's homes if they haven't been paying their HOA dues. And Mm -hmm. we were like, this is messed up. I brought up the fact that um, there was a building in Miami that collapsed, and I thought it was because the HOA had refused to fix the problems. Well, my mother, Brooke, hi, Brooke, thank you for the correction. The HOA actually had done uh, all the studies on the building and the structure and were like, hey, owners in this building, we have to fix this or it's going to collapse. And the owners refused to pay for upgrades to fix the Mm -hmm. building. So that's actually why it happened. So in that case, it wasn't the HOA's fault. In that in that case. In that case. In that case. I just wanted to make that correction in Florida. because in Florida, because I had made I had made a I made a totally wrong assumption about what had happened there. So Okay. At any rate, I just wanted to make that correction. Um and then also we talked on Friday about the Mercury Cafe's unionization conversation. And we talked about the fact that when I was there for a wedding, I thought it was being catered by Gringo's Tacos. Yes, you brought this up that, as as a change that was that, was, that you didn't expect. I was concerned. I thought, oh, if they're having catering at a restaurant for a wedding, seems like the restaurant part's not going good. But that day, I think that our show went out. Our friend Molly Martin at Westward wrote a story. What is actually going on with Gringo's Tacos? What's going on there is they're taking over the kitchen. So now I think you can get Gringo's Tacos at the Merck all the time. It was not that they were catering. Hmm. So I... I this is not uncommon. I think like for breweries and stuff, it seems like a pretty common thing. Is it? I have I, no idea. I guess I'm thinking, I guess I've heard of it a couple times. There's that place, the the dive in down on South Broadway. They have a the chicken place. Uh, the chicken place that take use the you know they operate the kitchen. And like 
a lot of places will just have a food truck that comes or a rotating group of food mm-hmm. trucks. So to me, it didn't seem that that strange that I, it's not what I would expect at the Mercury Cafe, but we have to know this is Mercury Cafe 2.0. It's curious timing that okay. owner Danny Newman would bring in a contractor oh. to operate the kitchen at the same time that his employees are organizing and potentially voting on becoming a union. Oh, Paul. It's I interesting. I think about that. Because I know the original chef, like the OG chef, retired mm-hmm. um, within this change of hands and things. So I know the kitchen was sort of in flux. And when I went to the soft opening or like the the non the the press opening that they did they had a brand new chef in there yeah. she had all these ideas i don't know what happened but maybe you're right paul oh yeah it's kind of sad i mean we don't know the details but True. um this is this is what was in the news yes and i just i'm glad that we i just wanted to say they were not catering they were actually running the yeah. restaurant yeah i i came so. away from that conversation on fridays very optimistic by the way just i don't How know so? if it was the way josh was talking about it but i was just thinking about it all weekend like this moment in labor organizing mm. and just like you know these conversations happening between managers and workers about like what's best for everybody and i just feel like there's a th- things are getting better in that department um has and it actually, changed your mind? Like, do you feel like you felt differently when we were having this conversation a, a year or whatever ago with the King Supers workers? I don't know. Not really. The King Supers workers were successful after all. And true. we haven't seen a big victory for any of these organizers this year, at least. That's but the King true. Supers workers got, you know, they got higher pay and improved protections through that strike. Which is awesome. Um but it's interesting what's going on in the economy right now. I, I, I saw this piece of data over the weekend. I wanted to just add to the conversation as another wrinkle because I think it's so interesting. Um, so you remember when Joshua was talking about like why worker power is, why this is happening right now because our unemployment is so low? Like he was talking about the actual mechanics of the yeah. economics. Yeah, like yeah. The, the, the whole economic picture. He was saying like because unemployment is low, workers have power because there are relatively more jobs than there are workers. So workers have a choice. Sure. And, which is fascinating because Denver Business Journal reports that at the same time that's happening, Colorado recorded a record number of new business filings this year. New businesses opening. Which typically does not happen when there's low unemployment like this. It's typically the opposite. Because, because no one's going to gonna go out and start a business when they can just go like find a pretty good job. Instead. That makes sense. Yeah. There's a quote here from a senior economist with the CU Leeds School of Business. He's actually a past guest from the show, Richard Wabakand. He says, entrepreneurial activity usually picks up really strongly when you have a lot of layoffs and people are out of the workforce. So it's a bit of a disconnect. Yeah. What's happening right now. Isn't that interesting? That is. But I, I don't think that, well, here's my thought. Yeah. What do you think's happening? The pandemic reprioritized a lot of things for a lot of people Yeah. who were all of a sudden out of their usual grind, uh, whether it was, you know, by choice or by the fact that their industry was, you know, decimated by the pandemic or just drastically changed the way their work days went. And I think a lot of folks went, and I've seen this with my friends, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to do what I want to do. And it might be run this mm-hmm. whatever business. Yeah. That's you know? kind of how I feel too. It's like, I think people, maybe coming out of the pandemic, maybe it's just the moment we're in but yeah. people want their own thing people yeah. want to control their own destiny they want to work for themselves or they want to create the work environment that they wanted to see mm-hmm. because i think that's something that folks don't think about is like you don't necessarily just want to be your own boss you want to be the boss that you wanted from someone so maybe you want to create that perfect work environment or you've seen i've seen a lot of people go into quote consulting work in an industry know it inside out and go wait a minute you know what I can just tell other businesses how they could pay me to tell them how to do this. And then I have my own schedule. Cause that's the other thing is people are realizing that time is so valuable and the, I don't know. I just think the pandemic put that into perspective for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I'd be curious to hear from small business owners or someone that's made this transition recently. If you're somebody that left your workforce, started your own business in the midst of us having what people see as a labor shortage. Why did you do that? And what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> what are you thinking? <laughs> you know, I'm thinking about someone who's like, well, yes, I started making homemade thinking? salsa Clearly. or something or, you know, yeah. like, well, call in, let us know what you think. Um, leave us a voicemail or send us a text to the 
Denver Entrepreneurship Hotline at 720 5418 Again, that's 720-500-5418. Let's go to a quick break and we'll be back with something else. We have something really great to yeah, talk about. Yeah, really it's interesting. Maybe my favorite story in the city. It's also, I think, the biggest story, but also one of the most slow moving and hardest to see. Um, so it's like kind of a constellation of different plans all revolving around one specific place in the city, this River Mile neighborhood, also the parking lots around Ball Arena, extending all the way down to Sun Valley and the old rail yard. I mean, Stan Kroenke is obviously a big character here because he owns Ball Arena and that lot. And he also owns Elitch's the land. Um, and he says he has, he has these big plans to develop all that, like with, you know, giant residential towers, a mixed use, kind of like a whole nother section of downtown is what he's been talking about building there. Um, we got some new news on this this week, but Bree, can you just speak to like the significance of what this, what is this big plan? How do you see it? I mean, it's really, like you said, it's hard for folks to picture because it's such a slow moving process. There's a lot of different projects in in process right now. But the other reason it's really hard for folks to picture is highways run right through the middle yeah. of these plans. And if you don't regularly traverse like Sun Valley and around like the aquarium on over to Platte Street, I drive that area a lot because that's how I get in and out of the city from my neighborhood. You might not realize all these areas are connected. Mm -hmm. So... Um, Sun I mean, Valley. they don't, they're not, they don't feel connected. No, they, they, they don't. You go There's... to Elitch's, you go parking a lot, you go to Elitch's and you enjoy it and you leave. Right. It's, it's not very like a secluded. neighborhood. You're not like going there and you're not getting an apartment and then getting a, going to groceries. Right. You know, it's totally different. Which is changing because again, Sun Valley itself is the neighborhood with the most residential existing in this part of the city. I mean, Sun Valley is being redeveloped as we speak. There's a rec center that's been over there, Rudy Park, beautiful forever. There's a lot of city services actually right over there. But if you you don't have a reason to be over there you probably don't know maybe you've gone to is it i think it's brooklyn's there's like a brooklyn oh, the crummy bar next to ball arena yeah. yeah but there's no but there's another brooklyn's oh really yeah by empower field it's in this beautiful <laughs> old the mercantile crummy bars near arenas <laughs> in the middle of parking lots yeah. <laughs> but all that to say there's just there's people and things going on in these separate areas but seeing them connected is very difficult and i think over the next 20 years, this is going to look totally different. They yeah. will be connected. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about the news this week, which was from the Denver Post. They reported that the Latino Cultural Arts Center, I'll ask you about them in a second, is poised to make the largest investment in Denver's Latino arts and culture scene in decades. Um, thanks to some state and federal money, um, also the founder of Latino Cultural Arts Center, um, some other partners, they're, they've purchased and are redeveloping some warehouses in, I think it's La Alma Lincoln Park, maybe mm -hmm. it's Sun Valley, it's right in the middle there, into what they're calling Las Bodegas, a quote, multimedia lab, cafe, artist in residence studios, classrooms with year-round arts programming, and more. The endeavor is focused on learning Latino history while forging a bright future for the predominantly diverse surrounding neighborhoods. Latino Cultural Arts Center is, it's right now, it's sort of a, um, how do I say this? It doesn't exist quite yet. It, the thing does, but the buildings, like what they're building right now. So there's nowhere for you really to go. They do have a small store that's sort of like a gift shop, but it's got these it's got all kinds of beautiful crafts and art and things on 8th Avenue in, in Sun Valley. It's called Hijos del Sol. That's like their one main storefront, but they're building these beautiful spaces. And I think the idea is to create the spaces that long have existed in Denver when the real estate was low which was a lot more space for artists. And in particular, what they're doing here is they're building these artist spaces and community spaces specifically to cater to and attract um, the Latino community and the, you know, sort of the diaspora of that across Denver, if anything. And I think that was really interesting was Alfredo Reyes, who's the executive director of Latino Cultural Arts Center, um, kind of talked about that. Like, even if you didn't grow up in this neighborhood or you don't live here, we're trying to create that thing that makes you feel like you're at home. And that just invites artists and the community to work together and do really cool stuff. So um, again, right now it's like kind of in the planning phases. They're still, get, they're, they're piecing the big pieces of money together, but they're going to build this beautiful campus in Sun Valley. 
And I think that it has the potential to be, it's right by Meow Wolf too. It's like- Yeah, speak to the neighborhood. It's Meow Wolf. What else is going on there? I mean, Sun Valley is transforming as we speak. The Sun Valley Kitchen is sort of this hub for the community, but there's housing all around it that's changing. For a long time, it was, um, it is still, there's a lot of, they're rebuilding the public housing, I should say. They're revamping it completely. Like if you ever see, they were called the Reds, which were the projects over in Lincoln Park or La Alma Lincoln Park, they're, they've been totally rebuilt around Mariposa. If you've ever been to Youth on Record, that was a, a more similar style building that they had in Sun Valley. They're redoing the whole thing. So it's still going to be affordable housing, but they're building these beautiful, gorgeous buildings along with market rate housing. So we're going to be seeing, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of more units in this neighborhood in the next 10 years. And it's going to become a neighborhood that people actually like more people know about other than like oh i grew up there or it's just like a hidden away place that's not going to be hidden away for long yeah and it's been and it's been divided by this highway yeah the highway i25 runs right through it so it really separates the west side from sun valley and so if you don't know again i traverse this area every day so i'm very familiar with it but it's I kind of it's kind of old Denver and that you don't see a ton of people yeah. around there because it's in the midst sort of of development. It's also just kind of been forgotten for a long time. The so. other thing that is dividing that neighborhood is this giant rail yard. Oh, and that's yes. the other news that I wanted to talk to you about. Burnham Yard, which is a fascinating place I didn't really know much about until recently. Um, but apparently the state recently purchased this giant rail yard. It's like 55 acres or so. Um, so they purchased it back in 2021 after the rail yard closed in 2016. And just recently, um, the city put out a, a call. They're, they're looking for partners. They're look, they want help reimagining what this rail yard could be. They say the future of Burnham Yard is a once in a lifetime opportunity to fashion the outcome of equitable transit oriented development and multimodal infrastructure improvements that will transform an abandoned rail yard into a thriving center that connects multiple neighborhoods together. I find this fascinating and I'm only laughing because I just read a piece that I had completely spaced out about this project was initially CDOT was buying this so they could expand i Right, right. I wanted to talk about you know, the, yeah. <laughs> Through the middle of the city. Yeah. And luckily, thank God, uh -huh. <laughs> they didn't have enough money to do it because transit advocates and human beings that live in this neighborhood were like, please don't anything expand else. anything Something but expanding else, the please. highway. For the love of God. <laughs> Again, the highway is what breaks this neighborhood apart. And we can't. Well, and so, the rail yard. And so the rail, but the, yes, and you're right. The rail yard is like the original sort of trans, or it wasn't, the, sorry, it wasn't transit. It was more commerce oriented rail yard stuff, but it really is in the middle of the city. And you may not even notice it too, because the highway just like goes right over it. Yeah. Um, but it is a really central location and it's historic it's 140 years old which is amazing paul the you buckhorn exchange is there right because it was serving this historic restaurant where you can still get rocky mountain oysters it's there because it was serving the people that worked at burnham yards right which is and burnham yards was an employer for folks in auraria um before that was knocked down and turned into a college campus that was a whole community mm -hmm. um people on the west side communities on the west side all worked in this in the rail yards and so but paul when we were talking about this earlier before the show you had a good example of like what it could be that you've seen elsewhere well yeah i mean anyone who's been down to santa fe in the last few years they have a rail yard that they have redeveloped into this beautiful center of, I mean, there's a farmer's market oh, there gorgeous. every week. There's a brand new indie theater. There's another theater that George R. R. Martin owns and that I once saw him behind. He was late to the, sh the showing of his own TV show. Ooh. He was scampering. I have a great video of it. It was so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> really made my day seeing him. Um, but I'm a fan. There's a there's there's definitely examples out there yeah. across America of turning these kinds of spaces, utilizing the older buildings, and turning it into something really cool. Yeah, I mean, I read a quote from someone around the time that the state bought Burnham Yard, which I, I did not appreciate at the time, but it has opened up the possibility for this to be a part of this new neighborhood and be a centerpiece. And this person was comparing it to Union Station, mm. like that's the scale of of the change and like the, oh. what this redevelopment could mean it could get, be the centerpiece a historic centerpiece of a whole huge neighborhood i like that comparison my hope is that it is uh for more 
classes of people. I don't feel that Union, Union Station is gorgeous. We love it. Yeah. I don't find it accessible for a lot of folks. I would hope that Sun Valley and the Burnham Yards project is the more uh, working class or, you know, that the equivalent of more folks can access it. And it has more things for more people at different um, in different economic situations yeah i don't know and it's sun valley too like this is one of the lowest income zip codes in the in the city i think and uh, while we that's the hard that's the hard balance right we see it in globeville how do we grow but retain affordability and also keep people in the neighborhood so they can take advantage of these cool things that are being built yeah like las bodegas which is amazing yeah. Uh, I'm really excited to see that. I'm really excited to see what the Latino Cultural Arts Center does in Sun Valley. I'm really happy that they are uh, this like very prominent entity for for the community because arts are just so much about what we are. I have a lot of cautious optimism about Sun Valley, hmm. for sure. I struggled at the beginning of this segment to name this project, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. series of interlinked projects, the River Mile, the Ball Arena parking lots, the Sun Valley redevelopment, and this Burnham Yard possibility. What should we call this? Like, I feel like this is one thing. I think it needs one name. Paul, you know how I feel about labeling things in this city. In but this now era. you have the power. I don't want that power. I want the community to have it. You don't, what do you, do you feel like Auraria would fit? Because 50 years ago, the the famous story is the city voted to displace all these people from what was a, a residential neighborhood in this exact same place. And then, then it became a college campus and it became Elitch's and it became Ball Arena. Yeah. Should we just use the same name again? New Auraria, maybe? Well, there's descendants of Auraria and folks that actually, I think uh, Anthony Garcia, who runs Su Teatro, was an Auraria resident. Let's ask them. Sure. And that, that's what's cool is I think, is it the city or is it, who's doing the I Am Auraria project? History Colorado. History Colorado is doing this amazing I Am Auraria project right now where they've been collecting stories um, from folks that grew up in that neighborhood to sort of build out a better picture of what their community was. And so more folks can know about what Denver, where Denver comes from. And so I, that's who I would ask. I wouldn't ask me. All right. Well, we'll talk more about it. For our last segment, we hear from you our lovely listeners, readers of the Hey Denver newsletter. I just want to say that we really appreciate when you write in and you call in um, because that's what makes this show super fun. It's, yeah, you it's my favorite part of the week. You respond to us and it helps inform what we bring to the table. So um, this week we have an email um, who this is, uh, pff, Paul, this is for you. This is about pizza. Love this it. is a consistent topic on this show. If you're just tuning in, we talk about pizza a lot. It's very important. Paul loves pizza. I had some last night, actually, from a place I'd never had it before. Uh, this uh, divey bar in Rhino River. Do you know it's behind, oh, behind yeah, Blue yeah, Moon? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. it used to be the, uh, what was it called? The Welcome Inn? But yeah, I know mm -hmm. where it is. I know there's a cool family there. That's a really there. cool bar. Cooler bar than the pizza was good. I think it was just like a frozen pie, but, you know, good good hospitality. I mean, I love a Totino's party pizza, so yeah. frozen pizza sometimes Sometimes it hits are good. the spot. So uh, we have a... We have an email. Daniel R. writes, I know Paul is the resident pizza expert, but I want to toss in my two cents. My husband and I were huge fans of Crush Pizza and Tap right across from the Chubbies on 38th. That place was good, Paul. I never actually went. Oh, it was good. He really liked their wings also. And we were both in love with their Sicilian style pizzas. They had one called the Hot Mess, which had spicy red sauce, soppressata, in-house pickled peppers, goat cheese, and honey. They opened a second location with a limited menu on East Colfax post-COVID, and then the whole operation closed not long after. We miss them so, so, so much. As fans of Sicilian and Detroit-style pizza, we recently tried Red Top Rendezvous in Jefferson Park, and it was to die for. The wings were not good, but the pizza instantly made up for it. Highly recommend. Cool. Oh, yeah. That's, okay. that's a hot wreck. That's a hot tip. Red Top Rendezvous in Jefferson Park. Yeah. So thank you so much, Danielle R. You are now, I don't know, the third or maybe fourth person who's recommended this place to me, really? including someone who I consider a true pizza authority and maybe even a secret pizza genius. My friend, Chris, he, he learned how to make 
<laughs> he went, he good old to, Chris. Chris. Christy. He learned how to make pizza during the pandemic, I think, and he got really, really into it. And it's been a few years. He got really good at it. Um, I, he started hosting these like backyard pizza parties. And my wife and I went a couple weeks ago. Phenomenal. I, I would try to convince him to open his own place. I don't think he's interested. If he changes his mind, listeners, you'll be the first to know. However, he said Red Top Rendezvous is the hottest the hottest zine town so since you can't get chris's pizza out of his backyard next best thing let's go with danielle's recommendation <laughs> of red top rendezvous hey, yeah no i'm, I'm very excited to try it and it's detroit style so it's like they're kind of stepping on blue pan pizza's turf a little bit mm. doing the trendy thing i don't know the, the chef apparently has a great pedigree real pizza people that's cool I, I, i'm very excited to try it Well, we are always taking pizza recommendations because, again, this is a consistent theme on this show. You can call us on the Pizza All the Time hotline, 720-500-5418. Leave us a voicemail, name a neighborhood, and whatever you want to tell us, actually. Pizza in memoriams also welcome. I do like this little tribute to Crush Pizza and Tap. Yeah, man, that place... If you lose your pizza place, I'm here here for you. I'm I'm listening. Well, thanks for joining me, Paul. My pleasure, Bree. See you next time. That's all for today here on CityCast Denver. If you enjoyed the show, why not take a minute to tell Adriana Abarca about us? Rate the show wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to our morning newsletter, Hey Denver, and learn more about us at denver.citycast.fm. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Bye-bye.